Hello, we're here at Chawton House um, and I'm here with my colleague Stephen Bending who's a specialist in landscape garden in the 18th century. So we're going to be talking about the representation of landscape in Jane Austen's fiction today. We find that it crops up quite a lot in her novels. So Chawton um, is somewhere that Jane Austen spent a lot of time and the landscape garden here has certain features which were replicated in her fiction as well. So we're going to talk through some of those features today. The first one that I want to mention is the wilderness. Um, and we find wildernesses in both Pride and Prejudice and also in Mansfield Park as well. So Stephen, could you tell us a bit about what a wilderness actually is? Well, wilderness has a, um, a kind of long history, in fact, and it's seen as a symbolic space in which you should be imagining your relationship with God, you should um, sit and contemplate and so on. But Chawton itself had a very much kind of formal layout in the uh, early part of the 18th century. So it was a series of um, diagonal paths um, in a fairly symmetrical form. By the time of um, Austin, it's starting to be seen as, a, in some ways, a slightly old-fashioned kind of design. Mm. And what sort of thinkers was Austin reading that would have impacted on her representations of landscape and also the way that landscape was changing at the time? Um, Austin talks a lot about improvements in her novels. What she does. She mean I mean, she, she's, she's very aware of what's, what's going on around her, not just in terms of um, writers. So she's aware of people like uh, Capron T. Brown producing um, gardens through the middle of the 18th century. He's the big figure. And it, the uh, person who then follows on from him is, is Humphrey Repton, and Humphrey Repton does write a lot. Brown tends to do these big expansive landscapes. Repton um, produces things which are much more domestic in scale in some ways, and so um, you're likely to get these kind of flower gardens um, and a notion that these are in some ways feminised spaces. Okay, could you, what do you mean by that? Could you say a bit more about that? Well, one of the ways of making sense of um, a garden like Chawton is to think about it in terms of uh, who uses the different areas of these gardens in different kinds of ways. And so park landscape um, out beyond the pleasure ground would tend to be seen as uh, somewhere for men because in large estates uh, those parks were really for hunting deer and so on. Chawton has a very kind of shrunk down version of that. Mm. Whereas uh, closer to the house you would have um, a flower garden, the walled garden, um, the wilderness itself, a shrubbery. And these are spaces which are imagined as in some ways um, outdoor domestic spaces. Um, and there's a set of expectations about how women should behave in those spaces uh, and that's something that Austin is acutely aware of. Mm. In Mansfield Park, Fanny warns her cousin Maria not to run off into the garden at Southerton with Henry Crawford and she warns her against slipping into the ha-ha. We actually have a ha-ha here at Chawton and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that actually is. Well, a ha-ha is, has, serves a very kind of practical purpose. It's, a, it's a, literally a sunk fence. The point about it is that it, it forms a barrier between the pleasure grounds close to the house and the park landscape beyond. And because it's sunken, when you look from the house out across the landscape, you don't see that, uh, that fence. They're clearly seen as um, symbolic as much as they are purely as practical features. And so that notion of a sunk fence gets used by all sorts of political writers as a way of claiming a certain kind of liberty, of freedom within certain bounds. So you're bounded, but you don't, you don't feel that boundary because you don't see the boundary. Um, and that's part of what Austin is, is playing with here. One of the characters uh, that's very fond of nature and that's written as having a real passion for nature is Marianne in Sense and Sensibility. Um, not everyone shares her view, so Eleanor says to her at one point, not everyone has your passion for dead leaves. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what, that, what kind of thinking that is referencing there. One of the things Austin is, is acutely aware of is, is the writer William Gilpin, who is the kind of popularizer of uh, the picturesque in the late 18th century. He writes a series of um, volumes of observations on the picturesque around various parts of the country, including this one on Hampshire. What a lot of people do is find a, a useful kind of um, formal language for saying, oh, it's picturesque in the sense that there's a, there's a side screen, there's a foreground, there's a background, and so on. That's the kind of stuff that um, Austin spoofs in uh, some of her novels. Um, Gilpin, however, is, is very much aware that um, what he's dealing with is an account of nature. In looking at nature, what you see is God. Um, 
I think that's where we might place someone like uh, Marianne. So it's not just about dead leaves, it's mm -hmm. about a sense of how you see the world, how you imagine yourself in relation to the world, and that, that there's a, a notion of, of divinity in that landscape. The resistance you get from Austin is, is to the merely kind of formal, fashionable language, which just um, uses terms from Gilpin, um, from the picturesque, and has mm -hmm. no understanding of anything beyond the merely formal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and so Marianne herself is, is actually aware of that. She talks about um, using hackneyed phrases and how hackneyed exactly. that has become. Yeah. Fact, and so, so. You, again, you get those kind of parodies. You get the same thing in Northanger Abbey of um, standing in front of a landscape and um, using a certain kind of language but not actually seeing what's in front of mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and making that distinction between a hackneyed, fashionable language, which means nothing, um, and a sense of um, what nature really is. And nature is always going to be um, imagined in terms of an account of oneself. Mm -hmm. You see this over and over again in Austin, that um, as you move through different parts of um, a landscape garden, it's constantly behind this is this sense of what should be natural behaviour. So much of Austin's fiction is dealing with that question of um, more broadly, so it's not just about what's in the, you know, what's in the landscape, is it? It's about kind of what's, what's natural behaviour all the time in terms of accomplishments and things like that too. Yeah, um, and I think especially in, the, um, in garden spaces, it's about how you behave in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, gardens are always kind of microcosms. They're always kind of uh, metaphors for something else or an account mm -hmm. of how you see yourself in the world. And mm -hmm. so, again, Austin insists, I think, that um, what people do in gardens is a judgment about who they are. Men have a certain kind of freedom in the landscape that men don't. Again, you might think about that in terms of something like Elizabeth Bennet marching across uh, a field, getting her boots muddy. Um, and again, very different reactions to that from uh, men and women, from um, Darcy on the one hand, who sees it's actually quite sexy, mm. um, <laughs> and on the other um, of um, the Bingley sisters mm. uh, seeing it as a vulgarity, mm. countrified, um, and to be laughed at, mm -hmm. and so on. But again, you know, the, Caroline Bingley is one of those characters where it's all surface, um, yeah. and there's nothing kind of real underneath. I just remember that quotation with the uh, with the books. I do desire there's no 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 enjoyment like reading, and of course she's you know she's yeah. using that solely as a kind of facade rather than. But she, of course, and that, that raises another thing, which is she's also linked with city fashionability mm -hmm. rather than the country. And so there's mm -hmm. the other thing that Austin is frequently doing is playing off a notion of the country as natural in some ways, versus the city as um, fashionable, as dangerous, as um, unconvincing in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, I think Austin is also making a distinction between um, landowning, um, the gentry, and mere farmers. So she, it's not that she's aligning herself with the kind of vulgarity of work and labour. Mm -hmm. It's very distinct. And again, the, the landscape here is about demonstrating um, leisured status. Mm. Um, it's not about um, a massive kitchen garden or something like that in which these, these figures would work. They don't. Thank you very much for being here with us, Stephen. Um, hopefully today you found out a little bit about some of the features here at Chawton House that made their way into Austin's fiction. These are features that are not just representative of the garden themselves, but features that Austin uses to talk about lots of other things in her, in her novels. So hopefully you can now go away and reread these moments where Austin does talk about gardens and about landscape and mine them for their really rich meaning and possibility.